All right, today's lecture we're going to learn about ceramics. So when we say ceramics, it of course includes glasses and various forms of carbon. So these materials, ceramics, glasses and various forms of carbon have unique properties that cannot be obtained with other materials. So what we're going to look at their structure, properties and applications. The most common ones are oxide ceramics like aluminum oxide, zirconium oxide and there will be carbides and nitrides. So glasses mainly uh, composed of silica, silicon oxide and we're going to look at glasses, their properties and applications. And then we're going to look at forms of carbon like graphite, graphene, carbon nanotubes, nanomaterials. These all have unique properties and unique application. So diamond we know is the hardest material and we're going to see what type of applications it has. Okay, so those are the topics we're going to cover in this chapter. So when we say ceramic, it is actually an inorganic compound. Polymers were organic materials, just like us, but ceramics, they are inorganic materials. They are compounds, meaning a metal or a semi-metal will be reacting with a non-metal in certain ratios. Ceramics are very important engineering materials. If we look at the general properties, okay, so general properties of ceramics, they have high temperature strength. So they're uh, because of the ionic and covalent bonds they have, they are very strong and this gives them also high melting temperatures. They are very hard. Okay, that makes them brittle. They can have transparency. They are very inert to chemicals, food and environment. They are safe, not toxic. And they are resistant to wear and corrosion. And they have low electrical and thermal conductivity. So what are the application areas of ceramics? They are usually used as electrical thermal insulators for high temperature applications, floor tiles to resist abrasion, transparent baking sheet dish, small ball bearings that are light, rigid, hard and resist high temperatures, Automobile windshields that are hard, abrasion resistant, transparent, cutting tools, abrasives, right? Optical applications such as lenses and mirrors that require high level of transparency. Some ceramics are magnetic, so they can be used in computer memories. There are bioceramics, uh, basically. In we, we can include the materials used in artificial teeth, bones, etc. So a wide range of application areas, very important engineering material. So we are seeing some ceramic components. Uh, the first one is high strength alumina for high temperature applications and in picture B we are seeing gas turbine rotors made of silicon nitride. So as I said ceramics are compounds of metallic and non-metallic elements 
and we divide them generally into two categories, traditional ceramics and industrial ceramics. And as I said, due to the presence of covalent and ionic bonding, these materials are stronger and harder than metals, which also makes them brittle. So, of course, when we say traditional ceramics, these are tiles, bricks, pottery, and when it comes to industrial ceramics, also called advanced ceramics, engineering ceramics, high-tech or fine ceramics, you can hear these uh, vocabulary also. These are like the materials used for more advanced applications like turbines, aerospace component, uh, heat exchangers, semiconductors, cutting tools, etc. So compared to other materials, actually ceramics has a very complex structure because so so it's a compound of metallic and non-metallic elements, right? So we have a wide variety of ceramics can be available to us. Large number of there are large number of possible combinations of various elements. And and different sizes, different complex structures. But ceramics are usually crystalline. And it doesn't have to be just two elements. It can be much more complex than that. It can have more than two elements like aluminum, silicon, oxygen, hydroxide hydroxide ion, etc. So mineral silicates such as clays are among the most abundant substances in nature and therefore they constitute the principal raw materials for traditional ceramics. And the most common example is kaolinite. Basically, it is a white clay consisting of silicate of aluminum with alternating weakly bonded layers of silicon and aluminum ions. And this is going to show you how complex the structure of ceramics are actually. If you actually look at the composition of kaolinite, it is aluminum 2, silicon 2, oxygen 5, and hydroxide 4. So actually these are silica, silicon oxide, a tetrahedral structure linked to the oxygen atoms of the octahedral sheet of alumina, aluminum oxide. So it is a complex structure, okay? So if we look at other major raw materials besides kaolinite, uh, those are the ones found in nature like flint. Uh, that is, you see in the image, that is a rock composed of very fine grain silica, okay? Silicon oxide silica is the same, okay? And then feldspar, these are very complex structures, okay? So a group of crystalline minerals consisting of aluminum silicates with potassium and calcium or sodium. like mixtures of clay, silica, feldspar, these are used in uh, tab as tableware. So there is also porcelain, it's a white ceramic 
that is composed of different uh, minerals again kaolin quartz well feldspar and this is used largely in appliances kitchenware uh, bathware of course i also suggest you guys to watch the videos uh, i am sending you because you will see the processing of these raw materials in those videos and other uh, videos that will help to visualize what we are talking about and these all ceramics these have impurities when we extract them from earth and of course then these impurities has to be removed prior to their processing all right so if we look at oxide ceramics two major types alumina and zirconia so alumina is have a high hardness and most widely used ceramic it is used in abrasives cutting tools as thermal and electrical insulation zirconia is having a high strength and toughness suitable for high temperature applications such as furnace linings jet engine components nuclear fuel fuel cladding etc and these ta this table also shows us other type of ceramics there are like carbides tungsten carbide which i asked in one of the uh, homework questions titanium carbide silicon carbide and then nitrides, uh, boron nitride, titanium nitride, silicon nitride, etc. There will be all these materials we will be covering. And you can go back to and see this table to get idea about the general properties and applications of a variety of ceramics. So this table also continues, of course, with including glasses, glass ceramics, silica, graphite, diamond, carbon nanotubes, and nanomaterials, and nanomaterial ceramics, and all we're going to cover in this chapter. Again, this table, if you read through it, uh, it will give you a general idea for the... Uh, properties and applications application areas of different types of ceramics so alumina or aluminum oxide it is the most important oxide material and it can be in used in pure form like alumina but it can also be blended with other oxide uh, to obtain properties and uh, obtain materials for different application areas. It has high hardness and moderate strength. So, of course, if you watch the videos, you're going to see how they extract alumina from earth and how it is processed. Alumina is today produced synthetically from bauxite. Okay. And this is using an electrical furnace. And it has, of course, it has pr pr impurities in it. And therefore, its performance may vary. And therefore, when we synthetically uh, produce them, we can control the uh, impurity level and the quality of the material. So, through control of the impurities, 
particle size, refinement processes, and blending alumina with other ceramics, strength and toughness of alumina can be improved. Alumina also have good corrosion resistance, low thermal conductivity, and good hot hardness. So that means at high temperature, it preserves its hardness. Of course, that makes them suitable for high temperature applications, such as cutting tools, abrasives, and in electrical thermal insulation. It can be used uh, as bioceramics that we put in our bodies to replace certain organs, certain body parts. Another oxide ceramic that is important in zirconia. Basically, zirconium dioxide that is a compound with greater density and flexural strength than alumina, but it is more expensive. It has high toughness, uh, resistance to thermal shock. So what is thermal shock means? Basically, when we expose the material to high temperatures, and if there is a sudden temperature change, let's say the temperature suddenly drops and goes back to high temperatures uh, within a short period of time, there will be regions with different uh, thermal expansion inside the structure and that can cause stresses in the structure because one expands and applying one region expands applying stresses on the other one, etc. And the material might not be able to handle those stresses. So zirconia has a good thermal shock resistance, wear and corrosion resistance. It has low thermal conductivity and low friction coefficient. Where we use zirconia in crowns and bridges, dental applications, right? Refractories, abrasives. So, there is important form of zirconia that you would come up with uh, this material in the uh, literature, come across with this material in the literature, that is called partially stabilized zirconia. That material is obtained by basically blending zirconia with other oxides of calcium, uh, magnesium, yttrium, so basically with this process the structure of the zirconia is modified and this gives the zirconia higher strength and toughness and better reliability in performance than zirconia. It also has a high thermal uh, expansion coefficient and the low thermal conductivity. This material is used as dyes for hot processing of metals, like hot extrusion of metals. And we see in the image a zirconia knife, a ceramic knife. And if you check the videos, uh, you will see uh, there is a video about this knife. Uh, okay, now let's look at uh, also in your book the uh, about the zirconia knife. Please read through uh, the book. There, there is an example. They are talking about using like advantages of ceramic knives over the steel knives. Uh, in the video, they are also talking about it. Of course, uh, because of its high hardness wear resistance, ceramic will 
last for months and it will not corrode like it is chemically inert so they won't stain uh, the food they don't stick to them easy to clean and there is not gonna be this metallic taste in the food besides that they are also lightweight and easier to use okay so let's look at now carbides so we've learned about oxides and now let's look at carbides so what are the carbides that we know uh, tungsten carbide titanium carbide silicon carbide and you are seeing the composition of these carbides in the slide so these materials are typically used uh, in cutting tools and dye materials because of their hardness and their resistance so usually they are mixed with a metallic binder such as cobalt and nickel this is to, to be able to shape them into fabricate them into products solid products because they are shaped from powders they cannot it's difficult to melt them like metals and uh, do casting molding right so from the powders of these uh, elements we try to obtain a solid product So tungsten carbide has good hardness, strength and very resistance. Titanium carbide also have the same properties but not as tough as tungsten carbide. And silicon carbide, again this has high resistance to wear, thermal shock and corrosion. It has low friction coefficient but it can retain its strength at high temperatures therefore it is used in high temperature applications such as combustion and jet engines so the important nitride ceramics these are boron nitride titanium nitride silicon nitride in general as a group these materials are hard and brittle they melt at high temperatures they are electrically insulating except for titanium nitride when we look at boron nitride this is the second hardest known substance the first one is diamond and the second one is boron nitride therefore it has special applications just like diamond it can be used in cutting tools or abrasives in grinding wheels it doesn't exist in nature and it is made synthetically Okay. and this is using similar techniques that are in the making that are used in the making of synthetic diamond diamond is suited for non-steel machining and grinding while boron nitride is more appropriate for uh, machining steel So titanium nitride is interesting. It is a conductor. It has high hardness, good wear resistance and low coefficient of friction with the ferrous metals. So therefore, this because of these properties, it is actually an ideal material as a surface coating on cutting tools. Due to being non-toxic, this material can also be used in the coating of uh, implants in medical applications. 
Silicon Knight ride. Um, it shows promise in high temperature structural applications because it has high resistance to creep uh, at elevated temperatures and low thermal expansion coefficient, high thermal conductivity, and it can resist thermal shock. Therefore, as I said, it is suitable for high temperature applications. It actually oxidizes at about 1200 degrees C. It chemically decomposes at around 1900 degrees C. So therefore used in components like automotive engines, gas turbines, rock, rocket engines uh, to melt crucibles and bearings, nozzles, uh, etc. So high temperature applications. So the next is Cylon. As you can see, the name says silicon, aluminum, oxygen, and nitrogen, right? Cylon consists of silicon nitride with additions of aluminum oxide, ethium oxide, titanium carbide. Basically, compared to silicon nitride, pure silicon nitride, this has higher strength and thermal shock resistance, and it is used in... Uh, generally in cutting tools. So CERMET, as the name tells you, it is a combination of a ceramic phase and a metallic phase. So basically they combine the high temperature oxidation resistance of ceramics with toughness, thermal shock, and ductility of metals. So it is actually a composite. It is used in cutting tools. And also have applications uh, like in nozzles for jet engines where high temperature application breaks for aircraft as well as electrical components that are subjected to high temperatures so silica uh, it is abundant in nature and it can have different crystal structures so it can have a crystalline structure like quartz, like we are seeing how silicon and oxygen arranged, and it can be, a, it can have an amorphous structure like in glass. Okay. So most common glasses contain more than fifty percent silica with other oxides. And the most common form of silica is quartz. It's a hard, abrasive, hexagonal crystal and used in communication applications such as an oscillating crystal of fixed frequency because it exhibits a piezoelectric effect. So silicates are usually when we combine silica with oxides of aluminum, like aluminum silicate, aluminum silicate, like when we say silicate, and then it can be combined, the silica can be combined with magnesium, calcium, uh, potassium, sodium, and iron, oxides of these elements. Okay, so examples are uh, silicate glasses, clay, uh, etc. For example, lithium aluminum silicate, this has a, a material that has a very low thermal expansion and thermal conductivity, but high thermal shock resistance. Uh, but it has low strength and bad fatigue life. That's why it is used in non-structural applications 
like catalytic converters, re regenerators, and heat exchanger components. So what are nanoceramics? So nano size, when we say nano size, it includes sizes up to uh, 100 nanometers. Okay, so these are ceramics where the particle size in nano sizes. So this is done because it improves ductility and manufacturing characteristics of ceramics. Um, so of course, controlling the particle size distribution and contamination is important. So it is important to have a homogeneous particle size throughout the structure to obtain the best out of the nanoceramic characteristics. Okay, so where do we use these materials? Um, uh, automotive parts, uh, rocket, rocket, rocker arms, uh, turbine, tur turbocharger rotors, jet engine components. So the difference between nano ceramics and just conventional ceramics, they exhibit ductility at lower temperatures because ceramics are more brittle. Right, and this prevents many of the applications application areas of ceramics because metals uh, are ductile and it makes them suitable for various applications. But ceramics are brittle, and to uh, come over basically to eliminate this problem, uh, nano ceramics are obtained. Okay, so. Next is basically porous ceramics. So that means there are pores in the structure, right? And these pores can be nanoscale, microscale, and these materials are generally used in biomedical applications, heating elements, thermocouples, diaphragms. And what are bioceramics? This is a type of biomaterial. And the biomaterial is basically, it has strength, inertness, uh, and this can be used to replace joints in the human body, in dental work. So basically, they don't react with uh, human tissue. Therefore, they are used in human body, okay? And generally, ceramic implants, the reason why they are made porous, like the image of a hydroxypatite, here we are seeing, because it helps the bone to grow. It is similar to the bone structure, so body can easily adapt into this structure, helping the bone to grow. Okay, so we also see ceramic hip replacement materials. And we are seeing that the ceramic bowl here uh, produced from zirconia and alumino brand, blend. Okay, so it is because of, this is because of their hardness and good wear resistance. So these are uh, coming to the joint, right? So we want them to have good wear resistance and chemically inert, don't react with the human body. So when it comes to comparing the properties of ceramics with metals, compare the metals they have higher strength and they have higher modulus and they can preserve this at elevated temperatures. 
they are less dense, more lightweight, right? And they also have low toughness. That's bad. And low thermal expansion, low thermal and electrical conductivities. Of course, when it comes to understanding the properties of ceramics, so if you control the grain size, basically the particle sizes when you synthesize them, and you can play with uh, the mechanical and physical properties. Also, besides grain size, of course, we need to be careful about the impurities. And these materials are very susceptible to the presence of defects, cracks in the structure, because they are susceptible to brittle fracture and the failure can happen suddenly. So when it comes to mechanical properties of ceramics, uh, as I said, first of all, it, they are very sensitive to cracks, impurities, and the presence of porosity in the structure. And they are, compared to in, uh, tensile strengths, they are very strong uh, under compression. So their uh, compressive strengths are high. The reason is, so if we have a crack... And if we apply tensile stress, we are forcing this to crack, to propagate on those directions, right? But when we actually press on it, right, in the side, in the presence, because the crack now does not have a uh, susceptibility to uh, propagation uh, under compression, basically that's why they have better compressive strengths. As with metals, um, the tensile strength of the ceramics will depend on the grain size. And with decreasing grain size and porosity, and the strength is increasing. So the pores are also, think about like defects in the structure, they can cause uh, cracks to form and propagate. Therefore, with decreasing grain size and porosity in the ceramic structure, uh, their strength is increasing. So many times, they in the processing of these materials, it is very important to apply pressure when connecting the grains of the ceramics to make sure to remove porosities as much as possible to uh, obtain better strength. So, in addition to the fatigue failure under cyclic loading, ceramics also exhibits a phenomenon called static fatigue. Uh, that means if we subject the material to static tensile load over time, the material can suddenly fail. So, it doesn't have to be a cyclic loading, like tension, compression, tension, compression, like the trend we see in general fatigue failure. This can also happen in static fatigue, like in the just application of a tensile stress over time. Because this can happen with the presence of water, because the water vapor can def basically change, change the chemistry of these materials because it can absorb, it can uh, absorb from the st structure, which can affect uh, basically mechanical behavior of the material. So, if we look at the effect of temperature on the strength of ceramics. We can see that uh, ceramics are very good at actually retaining their strength 
uh, up to very high temperatures. We see constant uh, linear lines, right? Horizontal lines. For example, for silicon nitride, silicon carbide. And of course, uh, some of them are low, uh, losing their strength, with, even though initially they have high strength at room temperatures. With temperature, increasing temperature, we see, for example, high purity silicon nitride, which is losing its uh, strength with uh, increasing temperature. So we cannot say all ceramics acting the same. Uh, we can just obtain experimental results and based on that we can comment. And in the figure B, we see the effect of temperature on modulus of elasticity for various ceramics. So it is a very um, amazing result. As you can see guys, the Young's modulus stays the same throughout uh, the temp increasing temperature because the modulus of elasticity or the Young's modulus <coughs> is actually a result of atomic bonding strength, atomic bonding. And because uh, atomic bonding is covalent and ionic, this in very strong bond, uh, these ceramics can retain their moduluses uh, with increasing temperatures. Of course, slight changes are observed. And here we see uh, different types of ceramics and their symbols, and what are their uh, strength values, moduluses, hardness values, Poisson's ratios, and densities. By looking at this chart, you can compare different ceramics. I see, for example, tungsten carbide has a very high density, which can limit its applications. And I see that, for example, diamond is the uh, hardest among those, right? So, of course, uh, this makes the diamond's elastic modulus uh, highest among uh, the other materials here. So, ceramic components that are subjected to tensile stresses may be pre-stressed. So, we know that ceramics fracture in tension because it opens up the crack, right? But when we pre-stress, meaning... Uh, we apply compressive stresses, a crack cannot start and extend as long as the ceramic is pre-stressed in compression. So, uh, tensile fracture will happen only if you apply large enough load to exceed the compressive pre-stresses and that are existing in the material. So the idea here is to uh, pre-stress the material with different type of applications so we can basically enhance its uh, fracture properties uh, in tension, okay, to make them better, basically. So how do we do that? There are techniques. One is heat treatment and chemical tempering, laser uh, treatment of surfaces, coating them with ceramics that have different thermal expansion coefficients so it can keep inducing compressive stresses. 
and some surface finishing operations such as grinding that can induce compressive stresses into the surface basically. So the worst thing about ceramics, of course they are brittle and this affects their machinability and grindability. So of course how can we uh, enhance uh, the any toughness of the ceramics is basically uh, proper selection and processing of raw materials, remove impurities in the structure as much as possible and all over the particle sizes like nano uh, ceramics these techniques can help us to improve the toughness of the ceramics so when we look at the physical properties most ceramics have relatively low specific gravity and specific gravity is uh, the ratio of the weight of a given volume of a material to that of an equal volume of water at the same temperature. And they have high melting point and decompose or decomposition temperatures. Thermal expansion and conductivity induce internal stresses that can lead to thermal shock. That's what I explained to you guys. And thermal shock and to thermal fatigue in ceramics. The tendency towards thermal cracking is lower with the combination of low ex thermal expansion and high thermal conductivity. So that means if you don't want your material to susceptible to thermal shock and thermal fatigue which can cause thermal cracking cold spalling when a small piece or a layer from the surface breaks off you need to choose materials uh, with low thermal expansion and high thermal conductivity because that way the differences in temperatures cannot create stresses inside that can lead to cracking and optical properties can be controlled by changing the structure or controlling the chemistry and very common example you guys may have seen in this one in your materials engineering class is the same material ceramic aluminum oxide depending on its structure the arrangement of atoms can have transparent translucent and opaque uh, material so if it's single crystal the light passes through it and it gives us transparent material if it's polycrystalline uh, light is scattered with the grains grain boundaries and this leads to translucent material and if it's processed in a way where it's made out of polycrystalline together with some porosity porosity also adding the uh, light scattering effect and then the material is opaque so the optical properties therefore change with the structure and change with the chemistry So although generally ceramics are uh, electrical insulators, they can be some of them can be conducting. You can add some alloying uh, elements uh, to make them behave like uh, conductors, semiconductors, even superconductors. So ceramics as we talked about has a wide range of applications they can be used in electrical and electronic industries because of their resistivity and dielectric properties they can also have magnetic properties that makes them suitable for applications such as magnets for speakers 
The good thing about ceramic, as we talked about, they can maintain their strength and stiffness at high temperatures, which makes them suitable for high temperature applications. So ceramics are therefore used in automotive gas turbine engine components. Uh, such as silicon nitride, carbide, silicon carbide, and partially stabilized zirconia. They also have low densities and high modulus. And it, they are used in high speed components for machine tools. They have high resistance to wear, make them suitable for cylinder liners, bushing, seals, bearings, and liners for gun barrels. They can be used as coating metals uh, and this can help the material to stand against wear, corrosion, and it can also provide a barrier, thermal barrier to the material. Here we are seeing bearings and they are which are made out of ceramics. So glasses are amorphous ceramics because ceramics when they are amorphous uh, they let the light pass through that's why they are transparent. And of course, how do we obtain an amorphous uh, solid? Uh, we do super cooling. Super cooling. That means you cool at a very high rate. That will not let uh, give enough time for atoms to crystallize, um, and then they just form a random uh, order, which makes them amorphous. Where do we use these materials? We use them in applications such as window glass, glasses for containers, cookware, lighting, mobile phones, and some glasses with special mechanical electric high temperature, chemical inertness, corrosion, and optical characteristics. And the ones you are familiar with is uh, fiber optics right these are glass fibers with a very high strength so if you watch the videos uh, you actually for next chapter you can see how glass fibers in fiber optics uh, are made so fiber optics of course the materials we use for communication by light with little loss in signal power. So all glasses, we learned that 50% at least silica and other, com uh, other ceramics, other materials like alumina. So silica is known as glass former. Okay, so so how what do what other materials we add to the glass to modify the structure we add oxides of aluminum sodium calcium barium boron magnesium titanium lithium lead potassium so depending on their function these are called modifiers so if you look at the structure you will understand so this is how is pure silica glass look like so random orientation amorphous structure with the blue uh, circles representing the oxygen and the gray ones are the silicon this is actually arrangement is in silicon tetrahedron so if we add other oxides we actually dis dis uh, disrupt the structure Right, as you can see, adding other uh, oxides like this causes more amorphous arrangement. So therefore, they are 
called as modifiers or intermediates. So this is helping us actually uh, for silica to form an amorphous configuration. So glasses can be colored, opaque, or a lot of other can have a lot of other uh, optical properties, like, such as it can be photochromatic, like darkens when exposed to light, or photosensitive, changing from clear to opaque, and etc. Form or cellular forms of glass. These are also possible. Okay. So if we look at what type of glasses we have, the most common one is soda lime glass, then lead alkali glass, borosilicate glass, aluminosilicate glass, 96% silica glass, fused silica glass. So different types of glasses are possible, uh, but it, uh, at least 50% is silica and the rest is uh, with other element oxides of other elements that we talked about. So typically in glass, uh, we add other oxides, other uh, elements uh, to actually de deform the structure to obtain an amorphous configuration and also to uh, lower the melting temperatures. And so, for example, fused silica is like a glass that is consisting of silica and, and with no other ingredients. And others, uh, the names are implying what does the component, what does the glass can have as a component. Okay, so this table gives us different types of glasses and what are their properties. So of course this is for your future reference where you need to go back and look at and understand, compare the properties of different glasses. You can check this table out. So when we look at the mechanical properties of uh, glass it is just like the ceramics so you guys need to understand ceramics are glasses they are actually the same uh, uh, forming from uh, same uh, inorganic compounds okay silica alumina etc so the, the difference here is the one is amorphous one is crystalline and glass just like the ceramic it is perfectly elastic and brittle. That means if you look at the stress strain curve, it's gonna be like this. So it's gonna show perfect elastic behavior without any plastic deformation, it's just gonna break. Okay, though they are brittle. And so glass in bulk form, it is much have much lower strength compared to a fiber form the reason is when the bulk form is of course bigger right and then the finding the presence of flaws cracks uh, the probability of the, uh, the finding the flaws and cracks inside the material is much higher compared to a fiber fibers are usually uh, f mostly uh, has much less defects and therefore their strength is much higher compared to their bulk form. Um, even the glass fibers are stronger than steel and they can be used in composites to reinforce plastics so they can be used in applications such as boats, automobile bodies, furniture and sports equipment. So of course people are looking at ways 
to enhance the strength of the glasses, um, meaning um, make them less brittle, okay? And this can be achieved by thermal and chemical treatments that can give them more higher strength and toughness values. So we're going to see them in late chapters later, okay? So physical properties are just just like the ceramics, they have low thermal conductivity and high electrical resistivity and dielectric strength. And their coefficient of thermal expansion is lower than of metals and plastics and sometimes even approach to zero. For example, fused silica, uh, or which is, as I said, amorphous uh, silica that has a very high purity, that has near zero coefficient of expansion. And we have seen, of course, optical properties can be again modified by changing composition and also with uh, how they are treated chemically and with heat. So there is another category, okay, and this is called glass ceramics. And as the name implies to you guys, you understand these are not purely ceramics, not purely amorphous. This is a mixture of glass and ceramic, mixture of an amorphous and crystalline uh, structure. Therefore, uh, these are stronger than just glass. Okay. They have near zero coefficient of thermal expansion. Of course, this makes them also have high thermal shock resistance. And compared to conventional ceramics, they have uh, the absence of porosity. Therefore, they are strong. And glass ceramics, where do we use them? Actually, uh, many places like cookware, actually biomaterials, cookware, heat exchanger, and gas turbine engines, radomes, and electrical and electronic components. So graphite, so uh, basically uh, this is a structure of carbon. So graphite has a high content of crystalline carbon in the form of layers. So as you can see here, okay? So bonding between atoms in the layers, they are covalent bonding and they are very strong. But the in between those layers, parallel layers, we have weak bonds, van der Waals forces. Of course, this makes the material uh, quite anisotropic, meaning the strength and other properties vary significantly with direction. And this structure also tells you why it is being used as a lubricant, solid lubricant, because the layers can slide easily over each other. So it has low frictional character due to the ease with which uh, it shears between the layers. So of course it is brittle but high has high electrical thermal conductivity, good resistance to thermal shock and to high temperatures. Where do we use graphite? Because um, it can resist to basically thermal shock uh, and 
It can be used in applications such as electrodes, heating elements, furnace parts, mold materials, seals, fibers in composites, filters for corrosive fluids. So interesting thing about this material is actually its strength is increasing with increasing temperature. So of course this is due to its unique structure and people are trying to figure out why this is happening. Uh, and there are some theories but this is what is experimentally observed that its strength is actually increasing with temperature. So of course in these images we are seeing various components made of graphite, uh, graphite electrodes for electrical discharge machining, etc. So these are more advanced forms of carbon advanced materials in used in advanced applications because of their unique properties so fluorines carbon nanotubes and graphene okay so these are all unique materials so if you these are just carbon atoms arranged in a different way so if it's in the shape of a soccer ball we call it fluorines or buckyballs and carbon nanotubes these are uh, tubular forms of graphite and it is used in many nanoscale devices of course these materials are uh, very expensive to produce and not produced in large quantities so people are working uh, in processing techniques to be able to obtain them at large quantities uh, and defect free so um, we can use them in applications well the applications for fluorines is they become superconductors at low temperatures currently no commercial applications exist for carbon nanotubes it is very strong okay and usually they are used as fibers in composites composite materials as of now the difficulties is uh, because these nanotubes tend to attach each other, forming clusters, it is very difficult to disperse them in the composite matrix, like a polymer matrix, because if we cannot disperse them homogeneously throughout the structure, they are not being effective reinforcement materials. It can be used in bicycle frame, baseball bats, golf clubs, tennis rackets, these composite reinforced composites can be used in these applications and they have actually very unique properties and for example one is uh, they have very high electric uh, current carrying capability they can be made semiconductors conductors depending on the orientation of the carbon structure So what do we mean if we look at this image? So look at the graphene structure and think about carbon nanotubes. So graphene is a single layer of uh, carbon atoms. Okay, And think about carbon nanotube as the rolled up of this graphene sheet. And it can roll up in a way that the structure is different. Okay, so it can have armchair, zigzag, and chiral structures. And this can change their properties. So armchair nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, they have high electrical conductivity, whereas zigzag and chiral, these have uh, semiconducting properties. 
again with as always with the other materials depending on the structure and the arrangement the properties are changing so armchair nanotubes they are capable of theoretically uh, carrying a current density higher than 100 times that of silver and copper so which makes them good uh, at, at materials candidate materials that are can be used in electrical connection for nano devices but of course these are theoretical and even they wanted to use these materials to build a space elevator from earth to moon so these are all showing you it, it has a potential to be very strong and highly conductive but of course these are theoretical meaning that these materials should not have any defects right but it is very difficult to obtain carbon nanotubes in pure form with defect free uh, structure because the processing is very expensive besides it can only lead to small amounts of uh, materials so graphene graphene is now a very famous material you i suggest you guys watch the video links i videos that I send you through the links in canvas um, as you see here it is a single layer of carbon atoms uh, in a hexagonal lattice they are a uh, hundred times stronger than steel and it conducts heat and electricity very efficiently so they are planning to use graphene in touch screens that are bendable Diamond is a carbon that possesses a cubic crystalline structure with covalent bonding between the atoms. So this three-dimensional arrangement of uh, carbon creates and gives them very high strength of diamond. Okay, very high strength. And Therefore, it is used in cutting tools, grinding wheels for machining hard and brittle materials and materials that are very abrasive, such as ceramics, hardened metals and metals other than steel. So, diamond is also used in dressing tools to sharpen grinding wheels that consist of other abrasives like alumina, silicon carbide. So diamond though has a tendency to oxidize in air at temperatures above 650 degrees C. Okay, so we are seeing um, some images of beautiful diamond uh, in the slide so nanomaterials uh, as I said these are from ranging from 1 to 100 nanometer they are also called nanostructured materials, nanocrystalline, nanophase materials. So compared to traditional materials, even the same composition, when made in nano size, they have superior properties. 
They have high strength, hardness, ductility, toughness, resistance to wear and corrosion, and unique electrical, magnetic, and thermal and optical properties. So when we look at the, comp the composition, it can be any composition of chemical elements, carbides, oxide, nitrides, metals and their alloys, organic polymers, as long as they can be made at nano sizes. So nanomaterials can also be used as reinforcement materials in composites to create lightweight components, strong and lightweight components with higher toughness values. Um, and as I said, they are expensive to produce and process into products. And people are studying and doing research on it, how to uh, synthesize them in large quantities with cheap um, techniques, basically. So there is uh, one thing dangerous about nanomaterials, and that is because they are extremely small, uh, they can be toxic and absorbed through the skin and cause damage to human cells, the DNA. So many times when people are studying nanomaterials, they also study the toxicity of these materials to human body. So if we summarized, we learned that ceramics are compounds of metallic and non-metallic elements. They have high hardness, high compressive strength, high modulus, low ex thermal expansion, uh, high temperature resistant, good chemical inertness, low density, low thermal and electrical conductivity. Unfortunately, they are brittle, which is worked on. People are working to enhance the toughness of materials of these materials and we learned that there is, we are classifying them as traditional ceramics and industrial or high-tech ceramics and glasses are obtained by super cooling they are amorphous and they can have a variety of different compositions which give them different optical mechanical etc properties so in bulk form they are at low strength compared to uh, fiber form, which is more defect free, but their uh, low strength and toughness can be improved by thermal and chemical treatments. And some uh, advanced materials like graphite, graphene, fullerenes, carbon nanotubes, diamond, these are also uh, forms of carbon, and all of them have unique properties. Diamond, we use them for cutting tools, uh, abrasives, dyes, and nanomaterials. When uh, we have any type of material in the nano size, they will have unique uh, properties. For example, a material can be uh, non-flammable in uh, bigger sizes, but in nano sizes, it's going to be uh, flammable or they can be non-conductive, it can be made conductive in nano size. So getting into the nano dimensions changes the whole characteristics, whole behavior of a certain material. Therefore, they can be used in unique applications. But then as we talk, they can be toxic and processing them is difficult. 